hundred. There's the nice lady. All right, so let me introduce Barb. Uh, Barb's been in Yellowknife since 1980, and she's been working since 1980. She's been in the federal sphere, the territorial sphere, the not-for-profit sphere, the business sphere, and the volunteer sphere. She's covered all of them, except perhaps learning how to retire. Barb's been a member of the Yellowknife United Church since about 1980 as well. And Paul Andrew suggested that we get, as one of our speakers in this What Reconciliation Means to Me speaker series, uh, someone from the United Church to talk about their efforts around reconciliation. And that's what Barb's going to talk about. So, Barb, over to you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, I do find it uh, maybe a little intimidating speaking to a group of lawyers. And it reminds me of a, a story about my grandmother. She um, rented out her basement suite in her older years to uh, young women. And uh, at one time she had a lawyer living down there and my grandma loved to play Scrabble and she would play Scrabble against anybody. So once one day she invited this young lawyer upstairs and they had a Scrabble game. And my, my grandmother always thought lawyers were the epitome of intelligence and higher education. And so she played Scrabble against this lady and she beat her and um, and we heard about that for a long time. She was very proud of herself. And so it uh, just goes to show that I guess you shouldn't be intimidated by lawyers. So while I won't be beating you at Scrabble today, I do hope that some of the things that I, I say might resonate with some of you and uh, give you some food for thought. So I'm gonna divide this talk into three parts. The first is about my upbringing, where I came from and how that has um, influenced my decision to get involved in reconciliation work. Then I'm going to describe the projects that the Elmife United Church has taken on in the world of reconciliation. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about how individuals can incorporate reconciliation into their personal and volunteer lives. Um, and I do hope this is a bit of a conversation, so um, please feel free to ask questions um, to Glenn, and he'll pass them on to me um, during this, or if you have any comments. So and because we're, with, uh, Yeah, because we're a small group, Barb, I think we'll just let people ask questions. And so if you want to ask a question, just open your mic up and, uh, and ask Barb. Okay, thank you. Um, so my upbringing... I was raised um, a little more rustically, maybe, than many of my peers um, back in the bush. Um, things weren't as they were in the cities. So my grandparents were considered pioneers into the uh, Peace River District of Northern Alberta. One grandfather came from uh, Toronto, Toronto area, prior to the First World War and um, developed a farm north of Grand Prairie. And the other grandfather came just after the First World War and made his farm west of Grand Prairie. Then they each married women from back home and they raised families on those farms. My parents met as teenagers in residential school in Grand Prairie during the Second World War. This was a, rec a residential school for farm kids because the roads weren't good. They didn't have vehicles. They stayed in town during the week. I believe they went home on weekends. When he hadn't quite finished grade 12, my father taught in a one-room schoolhouse three miles from the house my mother lived in with her parents. So he um, would walk back and forth those three miles to court my mother. And it was successful and they were married in 1949. In 1957, with three children and another one, which was me on the way, it was time for my parents to buy their own property. So they bought three quarters of land and homesteaded another two quarters south of Grand Prairie in a farming community called Grovedale. There was no town, no electricity, no telephone, just a one room school and a general store. The farmland there was cut out of the bush, out of the boreal forest. And there was no prairie land there at all, as there was 
on the farms where my parents grew up that was on actual prairie, which is why Grand Prairie is called Grand Prairie. To get to that farm, we had to cross the Wapiti River and there was no bridge at that time. There was just a ferry and an ice bridge in the winter time. This farming area had only been opened up 20 to 30 years earlier and there were still only a few families there. On the peripheries of the area, Cree people lived in the bush, living a fairly traditional lifestyle. The farm had only one structure on it. It, it was a log cabin that my family moved into. I recently asked my 93 year old father who had built that cabin. And he told me that the local Cree people had built it. I asked him whether they owned the land or what their, their status was on that land. And he said, I think they were squatters. And I replied, or maybe they thought it was their land. And he said, oh yes, they probably did. In any case, the log cabin had been abandoned for some years by the time my family moved in. I think the Cree people had a summer camp and a winter camp because we used to see them go by on the road and, and they'd be in a horse-drawn wagon piled high with belongings and kids and women and the men would be driving the, the horses. And I also remember wanting desperately to get on that wagon and go to wherever they were going with them. But prejudice and discrimination were the norm in that farming community and in the general population of, of the area of Grand Prairie. It was ingrained into us from an early age. By the time I started school in 1963, there were actually three classrooms, three separate buildings, um, still just using outhouses. We didn't have bathrooms or anything like that. I don't know how many students there were, but some of them were the Cree kids from back in the bush, many of whom came on registration day and we never saw them again. A few came on a semi-regular basis. I remember that in grade two, my mother would send me to school with lunches that were far too big for one tiny little girl to eat. So rather than face her ire when I came home with a half eaten lunch, I would give away a lot of my food to other kids. And the teacher encouraged this because some of the kids didn't have enough to eat. I ended up regularly giving half my lunch to one girl in particular, and she was one of the Cree kids. She was very shy and didn't talk much. And now that I think about it, I think maybe she didn't speak much English. In any case, she eventually began talking to me. Now this was a grade two, three split class. My friend Dawn, female, D-A-W-N, was a grade three girl that I greatly admired. She was the only child and she was the only, only child that I knew. And she was the daughter of the local forest ranger. She lived in a government house with an indoor bathroom and running water. Her dad was the only dad I knew with a regular paycheck and theirs was the only house in the area with indoor plumbing. To my mind, her life was glamorous and I greatly admired her. Her mother made her the most beautiful clothes. All our mothers sewed, but her mother made her really attractive rather than utilitarian clothes. One day after I'd been chatting with the girl that I gave my lunch to, I mentioned to Dawn that I'd made a new friend. Dawn told me, and here I'm going to use the word that was in common use at the time, you can't be friends with her, she's an Indian. I had no idea that that was the way the world worked, but I believed her, I totally believed her, and I cooled that relationship with that young girl, although I did still give her some of my lunch. At age 11, we moved to a new farm closer to Grand Prairie. The junior high school that I went to had no indigenous students that I can remember. It was a county school for farm kids. The high school was a different story though. There were indigenous kids, a few of them. When I look at my high school yearbooks now, I'm surprised to see them. I honestly don't remember any interactions with those kids. And I'm surprised that any of them persevered to grade 12. The non-Indigenous kids ignored them, probably didn't even see them, just like me. 
Our school was arranged into, I think it was six tribes for intramural activities. I remember I was a member of the Blackfoot tribe. I've looked online at the school website to see if the school is still using this method of dividing students into groups. I couldn't find anything about intramural activities at all, maybe because of COVID. In any case, there were a lot of intramural activities at that time and a lot of competition among the tribes. Each year there was a princess contestant chosen by the students in each tribe. And after events such as talent shows, the school princess was chosen and crowned. One year, year, one of the tribes decided it would be to their advantage to have an actual indigenous princess contestant and found a girl willing to participate. I clearly remember that her talent was dancing alone in a round dance or a tea dance or a line dance, whatever the, the Cree folks called it. She must have used tape music as there were no drummers there. Watching her shuffle around the stage, I remember snidely thinking and maybe even saying out loud to my friends, that's not much of a talent. Of course, I was looking at something I didn't understand that was completely taken out of context. It was only after living in the NWT, seeing drum dances and participating in some of them that I realized what she was doing. Without the sound of the drumming that reverberates into your body and the singing that, that sears into your soul and the community of people dancing around you, the experience is not complete. But that was her talent and she did the best she could in the circumstances. She did not become the school princess. After university in Edmonton, where I don't remember meeting or even seeing any indigenous people, I moved to Yellowknife as a newlywed in 1980. I got a job at the Canada Employment Center, which is now called Service Canada, where I worked with indigenous people every day, both as co-workers and as clients. It was the beginning of my education, but a slow beginning. I remember after a year or so, my husband and I went to a party at the Yellowknife Inn. We were taking a taxi home and went outside to wait at the taxi stand where there were a group of indigenous people already waiting. The taxi arrived, the driver looked at the various people waiting, pointed at my husband and I and said, I'll take you two. Did we say no, these other people were here first? We didn't. We climbed into the taxi and went away. I was also thinking this morning about a time working there with a, a man from Fort Simpson and how he had to take a week or, or more off work because somebody from his community tragically died. And he wasn't related to this person. And I didn't understand. Why would you need to take time off work if, if it wasn't a relative of yours who died? Um, I've since learned better about that too. Although I've come a long way, I feel like I'm still a work in progress when it comes to my relationships with Indigenous people. The prejudices you learn as a young child stay with you and are really hard to get rid of. Reflecting on these events and others from my childhood and early adulthood has informed my desire to participate in reconciliation activities. You may be thinking that my actions weren't very egregious. I didn't take anyone's children away and I didn't beat anybody up. I think they can best be described as microaggressions, but I like to look at it from the other side. Imagine you are a person who faces these, these kinds of small aggressions every day of your life, year after year. I know that I would end up being a very bitter and angry person in that situation. I felt that I needed to make some atonement for these and other events that have occurred in my lifetime. Then there is the greater societal need for reconciliation. As descendants of the people who colonized this country, we have a responsibility to make amends for the way the original inhabitants were treated. I find that if I take a step back and look at other countries that have been colonized, I get a better perspective. I've often been outraged by the way the in original inhabitants of India or South Africa or any number of other countries have been treated by their colonizers. 
I've just finished a book right now about Israel and Palestine. The author's parents were moved off the farm that they had that had been in their family for generations. They were moved to the Gaza Strip in 1948 to make way for the state of Israel. They were put in overcrowded refugee camp with insufficient food, no jobs, limited health services. I was horrified. Then I thought, wait a minute, there's some parallels here. When the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was appointed, I began to hear things that I didn't believe at first. While I knew by then that there were children abused in residential schools, I couldn't comprehend or believe that thousands, thousands of those children died in those schools around Canada. Again, I had some learning to do. As a Christian and a person who believes in treat others the way you'd like to be treated, it seemed the logical place to make amends was through my involvement in the church I attend. Although the United Church of Canada was not involved in any NWT residential schools in the NWT, they did run schools in other parts of Canada and have made, been very active in efforts to fulfill the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to improve their relationship with Indigenous people. So the second part of my presentation is going to be on the activities that the Yellowknife United Church undertook. And the first one was called Walking a Path Towards Reconciliation. After the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Report in 2015, we held a workshop, mainly for church members, although at least one other person heard about it and attended, in 2016 that examined the path that our church could take towards reconciliation in our community. Four speakers presented to the 22 participants before the group brainstormed activities that our church could undertake. John Stewart, who some of you may know, is a member of our congregation. He was then a director with the Department of Education, Culture and Employment. He talked about the history of NWT residential schools and the curriculum that he helped develop on residential schools, operations and legacy. Marie Wilson, who's also a member of the congregation and was a member of the TRC commission, she talked about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the 94 calls to action. Reverend Cecile Fossick, who's the United Church Reconciliation and Indigenous Justice Animator, at least she was at the time, I don't know if she still is, she was from Athabasca, Alberta, and she went through the calls to action that pertain to churches and informed us of what the National United Church was doing in response. And then our last speaker was Paul Andrew, who uh, at that time was actually on a, um, a regional um, church committee on reconciliation, talked about the traditional spirituality that he grew up with on the land as a young child and how that was severed when he went to residential school. And then he talked about his journey to reclaim that indigenous spirituality as an adult. All of the speakers gave emotional and powerful presentations. To close off the workshop, the group brainstormed ideas that our own church could undertake to help with reconciliation. <clears throat> and we did receive a $500 grant from the regional um, church area that we belong to that at that time included Northern Alberta, Northern BC, Yukon, and NWT. Our next project was the blanket exercise. So in response to the workshop, the blanket exercise was one of the, the um, things on our list of, of activities we would like to undertake. So we held that in May, in May of 2017. And the blanket exercise, you, probably are all familiar with it. It was developed by Kairos, which is a, an organization of Canadian churches that work together for justice and peace. The goal of the blanket exercise is to have participants role play Canadian Indigenous rights history 
by engaging on an emotional and intellectual level to educate and create empathy. 27 people attended that blanket exercise, including several from outside the congregation. The CBC covered that event. They came and, um, and taped it, and, or some of it, not all of it. And they aired a piece on Northbeat about it, and they produced a piece for the National Indigenous CBC webpage. The last I checked, it had been viewed almost 1,600 times, and the publicity resulted in a large increase in the number of times the blanket exercise kit was borrowed from the museum here in Yellowknife. And the church received no external funding for that event. Our next project was the birth of a family film night. So working in, par in um, partnership with the NWT Native Women's Association, the Law Society of the Northwest Territories, and the Canadian Bar Association, NT Branch, the church hosted its third reconciliation event with the screening of this film called Birth of a Family, followed by a panel discussion. The film is uh, from the National Film Board and it's very deeply moving. And it follows the story of three sisters and a brother removed from their Dene mother's care in the 1960s and adopted into separate families. The panel and, and that family reunited and that's the focus of this, uh, this film as adults. The panel included a lawyer who was Carolyn Wozniak, a social worker, Susan Fitzke, and a cultural expert, Milo Nakiko, and they addressed questions such as the role of residential schools in the 60s scoop, what has changed in the child welfare system since the 60s, and how culture can be reclaimed. Betty Ann Adam, one of the four siblings, and she was the associate producer and co-writer of the film, traveled to Yellowknife from Saskatoon to attend this event. She was a valuable part of the panel discussion and participated in media interviews with a local newspaper and CBC television. CBC radio played ex excerpts from the panel discussion the following day. Over a hundred people attended this event and it was coincidentally held on the same night as a um, fashion show, an indigenous fashion show at the museum, which also had a hundred or so people. So a lot of people were divided on which event they wanted to, to go to. So at both events, we were really pleased with the, number, with the turnout we had. And the feedback we got from the audience and the panel participants and Betty Ann Adam was very good. We received $2,000 from the National Church's Justice and Reconciliation Fund, $350 from the Canadian Bar Association, NT branch, and $500 from the Law Society of the NWT to put on this event. And not just money, but we had um, people from the Law Society on the planning committee of that. They we're very active participants. And then the last project is the one that almost happened, but COVID had other plans for us. And that was a pilgrimage to Fort Providence, which we were going to do this year. This project was inspired by a pilgrimage that Yellowknife United Church adherent Stephen Cackfee organized in 2019 to take members of his own family to visit the site of the former residential school and mission in Fort Providence. Um, Stephen, some of Stephen's um, relatives had attended that school. The Catholic Oblates founded the Sacred Heart Mission School and Orphanages Orphanage in the 1860s. And people were buried on those grounds until 1929. A monument at the site of the mission lists the name of the 300 people, many of them children from the residential school, who were buried in unmarked graves in the surrounding field. On September 30th, 2020, which was Orange Shirt Day, Stephen spoke during the morning worship service about residential schools and offered a challenge to the Roman Catholic, Anglican and United Churches to make a trip similar to the one his family had taken. And he also made that challenge in, in the Yellow Knife or in an article. Our congregation decided to take up the challenge. 
and we were going to travel to Fort Providence to view the monument, participate in a community ceremony, learn more about the people buried there, visit and learn from the local people, and in partnership with the community, develop a legacy project that would both symbolize this partnership and be of benefit to the people and the community of Fort Providence. One of the ideas we had for a legacy project, that monument is supposed to have a roof over it, which is, is there, but has never been properly installed. And we thought maybe that we could help with that. Fort Providence um, Chief Joachim Bonnet Rouge asked our congregation to go a step further and facilitate a workshop of community members to determine what to do with the graveyard site, the monument, and how to handle any other groups who want to make a similar pilgrimage. The workshop was set to take place in May 2021, with the pilgrimage to follow in mid-August. Two days before the delegation from Yellowknife was set to travel to Fort Providence, the May COVID outbreak in Yellowknife forced the cancellation of the workshop. During the summer, the community of Fort Providence was busy with the aftermath of the floods on the Mackenzie River, commemoration of the 100th anniversary of Treaty 11 and other events. Then in mid-August, the second outbreak occurred. We had received a $9,500 grant from the Justice and Reconciliation Fund of the National Church for this project, but we had to return it as the money was not going to be spent by year's end. Whether this project will happen in the future is unknown, it's up in the air. There's a new chief has just been uh, elected and a new council. And uh, so we'll have to see what their vision is for the grave site and the monument. So the third um, area that I want to talk about is choosing projects. And I thought I would end my presentation by talking a bit about how to choose successful reconciliation projects. In my experience, the projects that we completed as a church kind of chose themselves. After the first project, we had a list of possible actions, including watching a particular film. That film didn't work out, but I think it was Karen Wilford, whom you all know, who was involved in all of these activities, by the way. I think it was she who went to the National Film Board site and found some possible alternatives. And Birth of a Family was an obvious choice for us. And when we found out that Betty Ann Adam lived in Saskatoon, it was easy to invite her here to show the film and have the panel discussion. Coincidentally, this event occurred right around the same time that the federal government announced compensation for 60 scoop survivors. The blanket exercise was also on our list. So we were able to do that with people in Yellowknife, particularly from the Department of Education, Culture and Employment, who were familiar with using it. And as mentioned earlier, the pilgrimage idea came from a challenge issued by Stephen Cackford. There is funding out there that can be easily accessed for reconciliation activities. And we found that partnering with other organizations brings more energy and funding opportunities. We've also done some smaller things in our congregation, such as including some of the 94 calls to action in the Sunday Bulletin each week. We include books by Indigenous writers in our book club, and we commemorate the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. We also early on had uh, some of the kids made a heart garden, and what that is is hearts with messages on them that they wrote for the kids that went to residential school. And they put those on, on long sticks and stuck them in the flower beds around Northern United Place. At our first reconciliation event, I remember Marie Wilson talking about things we could do personally to promote reconciliation. I thought about that quite a bit and decided to take on a personal reconciliation project that was easy and fun for me to do. I chose to nominate an Indigenous person once each year for an award. I like writing and researching, and I know lots of people. 
So some years have been more successful than others, but I'm happy to tell you that Paul Andrew has the order of the NWT because of that decision of mine to personally make a reconciliation effort. So I would like to conclude by encouraging you to consider taking on a project of your own, either as part of a group of like-minded people or individually to promote reconciliation in your community or organization. I think you will find it a very rewarding experience. And that's what reconciliation means to me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Barb. All right, we have some time. And again, because it's a small group, what I'm gonna suggest is if anybody has any questions, just open your mic up and, uh, and pass them on to Barb. And I warned Barb that this was typically a quiet crowd, so there, there may not be any questions, but this is the time. If you want to, uh, if you've got any questions for, about anything that, that, uh, that Barb's talked about this afternoon. Maybe I should ask them questions. <laughs> that, that has even less. <laughs> you can try. You can try. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Linda Marcotte, the uh, United Church minister that's been here for 20 uh, months. And um, I very much appreciate, Barb, what, what, how you uh, presented your presentation. Um, it gives me a, a greater understanding of my congregation and our commitment to reconciliation. Uh, I'm, I'm someone that uh, comes from this east coast of Canada, and uh, I really didn't understand uh, a lot of what is going on with the TRC until I got here and started talking with my congregation particularly Marie Wilson. Um, I, I just wanted to say about the United Church as a whole, uh, we have given a formal apology to our uh, indigenous uh, peoples in 1980s in Sudbury at one of our general councils. And that apology has not yet been accepted totally because they feel we still haven't worked uh, towards reconciliation or reconciled. And there is a cairn that's in uh, Sudbury. You can go online and look at it. And uh, it's a stone cairn that uh, once, uh, as they review over the years where we have come uh, on our journey of reconciliation, they'll add more stones to it. So th that's an interesting thing that the United Church as a whole is involved with. And also um, our symbol uh, at one time was just in Latin and English in, in 1925 when we became united. Uh, we eventually uh, had uh, French at it. And then we do have now in Mohawk, uh, that was the language that was chosen because there's uh, so many languages that could have been honored. But Mohawk is because that's the first one that the uh, Methodist Church uh, became involved with when they came to the settlers. Um, and it, it means all my, uh, all my relations. So Barb, when you spoke about having to have time off work for uh, a funeral of a community member, um, that's what the United Church is recognizing about their culture, and we honor that. We try to honor that. Thank you, Linda. I'm, I'm glad that there is somebody on this call to be able to talk about what the National Church is doing. Um, I'm certainly no expert on that. I've just been more involved locally. But I, I do remember when we had that first workshop, being very impressed that it was just one year beyond the um, release of the TRC report and the calls to action and how much our national church had already been doing to fulfill those calls to action. Thanks again, Barb. Last call for questions, anyone? 
All right. Then I want to thank Barb and as well, Linda, for their presentation this afternoon. This is going. This was recorded, you'll recall, and it will show up on the Law Society's YouTube channel. What I'll do is for uh, Barb and Linda, I'll send you the link once it's up so you can pass that on if you want. Otherwise, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Barb. And uh, have yourself a fine afternoon, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.